one of the older ones. We're going to talk about Profinet for IoT, IIoT, and Industry 4.0. So Internet of Things, what's a thing? And of course, a thing's anything. Um, we've got lots of different areas that we can see on there. Um, some unusual ones, animals, but this tends to be to do with feed, so fish these days. You know, we want to get them nice and fat and very quick, so there's a few things we can do on there. So we can measure the, the, the feed rates that they do and also control the light levels that they have as well to simulate the lights. I think most people, I'm not one of them, Maybe you have a Fitbit on a watch or things like that, so plenty of exercise, so we're used to that. Most traffic lights these days are going to be automatic and uh, connected Wi-Fi wise. So how do we connect them? Well, that could be um, with the network, so 2G, 3G, 4G. Um, certainly RF side, we've got Zigbee. We've still got hardwired LANs, which is used an awful lot, but Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and of course, for some of the, like the RFIDs, we're looking at NFC connectivity on there. So anything that has an IP address and connected is a thing. So Internet of Things isn't fairly new. This has been around an awful long time. So 1999 is when the concept was made for Internet of Things. And that was by Kevin Ashton, so British, fly, you know, fly the flag. So with the Auto ID labs um, in Cambridge, they brought the RFID tags out. Previously, we'd be using barcodes, but the problem with the barcode, it's one way you can only read it. What they needed was the capability, especially with automotive industry. And I think most of our technologies, PLCs and everything today, has been driven initially from the automotive industry. They've got the money to spend. And what they needed to do on engines and things is to test the sequence going through because you could end up where an engine is more or less, it passes, but just on the borderline. So at the end of the day, it isn't a good one. So they want to be able to write the results on and the results stays with the device rather than in the system. So if something stopped, you can start up without having a, a flush and a refresh on there. So RFIDs have been very important. And of course, without another good Brit, so Tim Berners-Lee, he actually invent, invented the World Wide Web. So Industry 4.0 and most of us today would be very lost. Certainly our children would be. Take a smartphone off them and the world ends, doesn't it? So M to M, there's lots of different areas. So it's going to be hard, unfortunately, to, to see where you are. Um, we've got bright lights, which doesn't help as well in here. So what we have is the, the different areas on here. And we've got different functionalities. So. The, we've got devices, we've got locations, we've got application groups, and we've got service sectors going around this way. And then we've got the, the different types of industries on there. So we've got the um, buildings, we've got energy, we've got industrial around here. So if we just advance another one. So when we're looking at transportation, we're all pretty used these days to waiting for an Amazon package, go on the web, and it'll actually tell you when it's due to arrive. So we've got the capability where the vehicles, they know what the where the location is. You can actually see where it's at, as well as um, you know when it's due, and also confirmation when it's been put through your letterbox or possibly somebody else's by mistake. So, so when we look at the consumer side, lots of people now are fitting the temperature control, lighting control. So houses are going very much that way as well. And with that one, that's the Fitbits for the watches. And there's what we want is industry. So we're really only interested. We're not into the IoT. We're really looking at the IIoT, which is the industrial internet of things. So business models have changed, changed dramatically. So you know, it's not just bookstores, it's even libraries. You know, there's very few people using libraries these days, and if they go to the library, it's probably to use the computers because they haven't got one at home. So instead of reading books, we tend to do the e-books these days online. Um, the other things we have, uh, yellow pages. Been a long time since we have yellow pages, and it's just as well. You know, use Google, go on there and find out what you want. We've got record stores, and it's not just record stores now. It's um, you're looking at even Blu-rays. So the situation where most people are streaming for the music, but they also, as well, you're doing that with videos and movies. You go to a store these days, and most of them have just taken DVDs and Blu-rays off the shelves. 
So that's a big change in area. And we're getting very Americanized as well now. So I don't know about um, doing car sharing, but certainly Uber is getting more prominent, more and more vehicles on there. So plenty of people today. I'm not going to get a taxi, I'm going to get an Uber. Very quickly, because this has been done a lot. So Industry 4.0, um, I did say when this came out, I thought it was marketing bullshit, which at the time was probably right. But this was the German government going back to 2010. And they were with um, Bosch to try and get the industry moving. And it was only talks. And then 2011, it went a bit further. And then 2012, Siemens and others got involved. And it became more active. In 2012, at Hanover Messe, the concept of Industry 4.0 was really pushed very hard. So I was always aware of the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution. Wasn't aware that was a two, three, and a four, but I think that was the marketeers. So we all know with the mills using water and steam instead of children doing the rotation or donkeys. So that was certainly the start in the UK of the Industrial Revolution. However, the second industrial revolution was the use really of mortars as a prime mover. So the electric mortar. And you had the conveyors and it ended up where Ford used the conveyors on there, but it actually started in Cincinnati in an abattoir was the first one. So Henry Ford pinched the idea on something you saw a few years earlier, but that was the real form of mechanization. Then of course, good old Modicon in 1969. 1969 is not that far away. Not for me, it's not. For a few people, it may be where they weren't even born then. But 1969, before the first PLC, prior to that, it was timers and relays and cabinets. So that revolutionized certainly how we control things. And that's the way we do it today in the main. Going back to the fourth revolution, that was a concept. And really, you were looking at 2030, 2025. We're now 2021. So it isn't a concept. It is being deployed. It is being used. You know, we look at um, the applications, and there's plenty out there where Everything there, you know, you've got digital twins, so you can simulate, so we'll go through some of the things as we go on. Field bus organization's been touched. This is slightly old, um, but what we have is the major protocols. So Profibus, if you look at the date on there, the Profibus group was founded in 1989. I was actually working at Phoenix Contact at the time, so when that came out, that was actually Profibus FMS, 500. It hurts. So it was very slow in comparison to what we're used to today. Eventually went to DP, and then PA came out for the process automation side, which has been touched on already. But that technology was maintained because you need power and control. And of course, we've just mentioned there Profinet PA, which is going to be APL, and Phil's got a good session to do on that later on. That's going to change things there. So the move to Ethernet for Profibus was Profinet. And it isn't a direct change. It is different. It isn't exactly the same. But that is the Ethernet flavor. I fought years ago with Vargo to get Modbus TCP IP before Profinet was there. And the problem being was control engineers would have problems with IT engineers, because it was going to be on Ethernet. It would be IT that would get it, not the control people. But there's been a nice progression of all the major field buses. So ODVA, which is for device net and Ethernet IP. We've got the field comms. So this really kicked it all off in a way, because ISA, in 1985, prior to Profibus, wanted one world standard. And you had the Germans print Profibus, the um, Americans print device net. We had FIP, which is Noren here, which is the French Perrin, and the Foundation Field Bus was the one that ran. But nothing happened from 1985 until 1994, and that was the hazardous area side. And then we've got the good old Modbus TCP, IP and Modbus, which was one of the originals because that was Modicon, now owned by Schneider. But look at the membership. So Profibus is maintained and done so well because it changes. We had Profibus 
we then called it zero, then one, and then two. So we had the, the three different variants on there to keep abreast to do what the market needed. And it's the same with Profinet. Profinet's changing and being adapted as required. The major partners you can see there as well. And the other thing that's really prolific on this is the competence centers, the test labs, and the training centers. It's been imperative, and this is worldwide. It isn't just in Germany. Profibus and Profinet isn't just Siemens. It's always been an open standard. But Siemens, of course, put a lot of money behind it and makes certain it, you know, it is where it is today. So this is just to give a bit of a flavor. So this is HMS. So We've got them present here. This is the um, the latest donut that they've got on there. And you can see that Profinet is 18% and Ethernet IP is 17%. Very much the Americas and Japan certainly go with the Ethernet IP side, but the Europeans and still the Americas would use Profinet, but it's a bit of a swings and roundabouts in a way. Ethercat's well down on there, but again, that's grown. And then the conventional field buses, you can see Profibus is leaps and bounds above everybody else. However, the important thing is the field bus is a contracted market, whereas the Ethernet part is a grown market, and wireless has even grown more. So if you look at that, the growth is higher on the wireless market segments on there. So there is a change, and of course, Profinet does have the capabilities to be on wireless. So things change. You know, nothing stands still. And if a protocol stands still, there's many that's died and they've gone. Profibus is still around for a while. We'll still make Profibus products, but Profinet now outsells Profibus. And the Ethernet side is the important part, really, for Industry 4.0. So how did we start off? Process in the early days was process workers. When I was eight years old, my father, went from the railways as a process worker at ICI at Billingham. And what they were employed to do is watch the gauge, turn the valve. They might have a few to do. That could be flow rates, it could be filling a container, it could be mixing chemicals, or using superheated steam to actually increase the temperature to a certain limit. And what they'd have to do is manually turn this as a regulator. So the good ones, my dad was, Really, they were doing PID auto-tuning in a way without really realizing it. The ones that weren't good, you know, maybe it's binary, they're going to be a four-bit the way they do things. My dad would have been a six-bit and been a bit smoother. Things worked out a lot better. It wasn't until a little later on when we got motorized valves, which meant you could then control that remotely at a distance, but you'd still need to watch the gauges because we didn't have anything to sense. And then, of course, you know, people like Anderson Hauser and Siemens, they actually brought out metering systems which could be done remotely with typically 4 to 20 milliamps. That's of course you with the Germans, which still use 0 to 20 in some instances. We tend to, uh, to follow the Americans on that. So 4 to 20 milliamps gives us long distances, um, you know, transportable within the field. Because when you're looking at process control, distances involved. When you look at factory automation, not so much distance, but they certainly need more speed. So we've got the, the mixtures. Then along came field buses. So Profibus DP, FMS originally, which is more for the robots, than the DP because it was deterministic. And we still needed something for the process. So Manchester and Corden, something else British, that's Salford University brought that out. So Manchester is Manchester UK, not the USA. So Manchester and Corden allowed power and data to be on the same pair. So this is the way things progressed over the years. Then eventually we brought Profinet out. So Profinet is the Ethernet gateway which can get the information directly into the cloud. But we use proxies. Peter, later on, will go over proxies and some of the other things as well. So what we have now is the situation where we've progressed, where we've got plant where we can read values and we can actually write values we can control. So we've got the situation where things are digitally controlled. That's the other thing as well in the early days where things would have to be calibrated. And when you've got transmission distances or maybe it's using 0 to 10 volts, you're going to get problems with noise and other things to affect things. So if you can digitize at point, that information now will maintain its accuracy all the way through. So it's important to digitize as soon as possible. 
and then what's next? So a little bit slow on the graphics. We've already mentioned the Internet of Things, which is everything. We're more interested in that little small part. So we're looking at Industry 4.0. And the progression from that, we're all used to the ISO OSI model where we've got the seven layers. That was important for communications, going back to the days of Xerox when they invented Ethernet. That was great until you got multiple manufacturers and the kit wouldn't work together. So it was important that everybody was using the same cable and the same pinouts, the same protocols and the voltage levels. So this is where the OSI model came in. And um, what we have is a flat stack now with this, and this is actually the RAMI model. We'll see that just now. So Industry 4 RAMI. So the RAMI is the reference architectural model for Industry 4.0. So where we're used to the pyramid, the automation pyramid with the MES and everything else, we still have that on there. So from a controls point of view, that's what we're interested in, the automation pyramid. However, when we're looking at industry 4.0, it's more than that. You're looking at the development of the product, the manufacturing of the product, the lifespan changes within that product, and then also the withdrawal of that product. So you're looking at the whole life cycle. And it's no good just talking about it. Without standards, we have problems. So this is where the RAMI 4 came in, where it was putting these standards into place to look at that. So we're looking at the business side as well and the projections. Even so now, you know, we've just um, had the situation you know, with the um, net zero, so carbon neutral. So COP26 didn't probably do what it should have done, but people are more aware now. And to be able to reduce carbon content and things like that, you've got to measure. And if you can't measure, you can't control. So that's an important part as well that Profinet can play. So this is where that middle sector is the industrial internet of things. And everything else that's going around it then makes it into Industry 4.0. So the IoT, a bit of a revolution. It's about things. It's very ad hoc. It's important but not critical, user serviced. And then we've got devices and standards, regular and proprietary solutions. When we're looking at the industrial environment, we've got to be controlled and we've got to have a measure. So IIoT isn't really a revolution. It's an evolution and it's got to be controlled. We're talking about data. Data is important. It's got to be structured connectivity, hence Profinet. Not just Profinet, there's other standards as well. It's very mission critical because we're looking at manufacturing systems. It could even be safety systems. So analytics, security, data integrity, response times, very important. So users and OEM, vendor serviced. So you know we've got to have continuity of supply and existing standards and devices integrated. And we've got to have very defined standards. Without defined standards, we don't get the interoperability. So evolution. So on this part there, data access is important on there. We need the performance. We need profiles, we need proxies. When we're saying profiles, we've got the different areas with machine tools and safety. And that ensures that everybody conforms to that. And the proxies is a way of getting the legacy systems into the Ethernet environment. So it's already been mentioned, and you'll hear that through the day. And Peter's going to do a session about getting things onto Profinet. So proxies is where it's done. <coughs> Uptime's very important. You know, what we don't want is lost production. In the main, all the diagnostics and everything else is going to improve that. However, one of the problems we've got is if people are not trained up, they don't know what the diagnostic information is telling them. So it's still important on them. We still need the test equipment side on there. It's very fault tolerant for safety point of view. Security, especially when we're looking at the cloud and everything else, is very important. When it comes to utilities, some of them won't use Wi-Fi. RF signals because they think they might be in jeopardy of being hacked. You know, brown hat, black hat, everything else on there as well. So security is a major area of concern and it has to be addressed all the time. Openness. 
open standard. So Profinet isn't owned by anybody. It's an open standard. It's published. You manufacture to that standard, get tested to that standard. We've got interoperability on there and the multi-vendor. You know, going back in the early days, proprietary systems, Siemens PLCs used Siemens I.O. Phoenix Contact used to do controller cards with Phoenix's I.O. on. And you, you know, you had the, the, the major ones like Alan Bradley brought out a device net, Phoenix had Interbus. Proprietary systems didn't go very well. Making them open allowed them to survive and last. So I say Profibus has um, had a very good run and is still strong. So the automation pyramid, so we've got the enterprise resource planning at the top. So physically this is gonna be orders coming in, billing for product and things like that. We've then got the manufacturing execution systems, which is controlling that. So this is probably gonna be industrial PCs or PCs, which is then sending information down to the actual PLCs to do the control. And that would be typically with Profinet. And then at the bottom end, we could have Profibus, Profibus PA, IO Link, other protocols on there as well via the proxies. So that's the standard automation pyramid. When we go to the cloud, you know, it's the cloud, of course, isn't up in the sky somewhere there. It's going to be a data center somewhere. And that could be anywhere at the moment. Um, Going, going on that, you've, you've got data centers, the, the biggest supplier for this type of functionality for connectivity is AWS, so Amazon Web Services. Amazon have 32, 31%, it swings a little bit each way, but then the next three, so the, the second, third, and fourth combined together, are just matching what Amazon do. So Microsoft Azure, you've got Google. IBM Bluemix has been displaced by, um, oh, was it the little, the Chinese one? Alibaba. Alibaba, thank you, Alibaba, yeah, so gone brain dead. So that's why I need to retire in March. Gray cells are gone. So Alibaba's displaced IBM on there. You've got most people were using AWS, but what's happened with Microsoft, they have lots of cloud services, and more importantly, they're given the capability for people to stay on site. So instead of going into the cloud and the security risks, you can actually stay and have the whole system working as though it is in the cloud on site, but then when you do need that extra connectivity, you can go into the cloud itself. So they're picking up a lot of the industrial side on there as well. So that's, that's moving at a, at a big pace. So, but it's still a long way from AWS. AWS aren't as slick where it is a bit more slicker with Microsoft. So at the bottom end of the field on there, we've got Profinet of Things for the industrial side. And the protocol that's used or preferred isn't solely that, is OPC UA. And that comes in a little bit further on as well with things like TSN. So that's the medium that is preferred to go from the controllers into the cloud environment. Um, other manufacturers are still, they'll always use OPC UA, OPC UA, but also as well MQTT is very popular on there. Going back to the older stock with the Profibus um, PA, we've got the uh, FDI side on there. So the field device integration tools which people like Enris and Howes has been using a lot and, and shown over, over the years on there. So physically, we've got two routes where you can actually get information to the cloud. So you can go straight from PA in the future with the Profibus, sorry, Profinet PA, which is the APL. That'll be another option where you can get straight into the cloud and good reasons for that. So it's all about data. It's important. So why do we want data? So we're gonna be using Profibus, Profinet to collect that data. The Profinet environment gives us a direct access into the cloud environment. So once it's collected, it'll be published into the cloud. You've got different then apps which can then look at that, analyze that, then more importantly decide what happens with it and it comes back and then it's reacted upon. What some people are professing is you're gonna take a sensor and that'll go directly into the cloud. It works all right but we've had experiences where providers have had outages 
of up to 24 hours. You don't want your, your plant to stop for 24 hours, so it's important to physically have some local control on there. Fair enough to fine tune things or to change things, use the cloud environment like that, but if you're gonna use it, certainly safety systems, there's no way you could afford to be on a cloud connection like that. So even with the 5G applications on there. So what we're looking at is, this is to fine tune things with respect to uh, what's happening within the control process. So data, lots of data. This is the other thing as well, with that buffer and some of the data that's there, you're gonna pay for the data that you send into the cloud. So this is where now um, edge devices are coming in. So that could be the controller, it could be a computer but the edge will act as a buffer in case anything happens. It has the capability of doing local control and it will then send the information packed in such a way to make it more usable and more cost effective into the cloud itself. So we've got various amounts of data on there and of course we would need a firewall if we're going outside the environment. So there's the options where you know, using the local area network within the company itself. Some don't like any access outside on there. So there's other options as well where you could do 4G or 5G devices which are physically gonna go directly into the system itself then and uh, give a bit more security. So what's big data? You know, kilobytes we used to, megabytes, gigabytes, fair enough. A lot of people are starting to get aware now. You can get terabyte drives, even SSD, you know, drives as terabytes, but we're then into petrobytes. And further on, we're gonna have zettabytes and yottabytes because we generate an awful lot of data, especially with some of the programs, Tinder, I don't know what that is, you know, things like that. So there's lots of people on there, lots of people generating pictures and text messages and, you know, Facebook, they're massive for what they generate. When you look at the utilities, you know, water companies, they generate an awful lot as well. So there's still a lot of data in the industrial environment and we need that data. But more importantly, you've got different facets who are not aware that data is already there and they'll actually try and then gain that data themselves. So the beauty about once that data is, you know, being obtained and generated, if it goes into the cloud, you can then share that via REST with different apps and do different things with it, you know, different analytics. So what we've got on here, so data access performance. So this is just really showing the different areas of um, Profinet itself where we can vary the actual scan times that's on there. And we're looking at the standard where we could get up to 10, sorry, 10 LEDs up to roughly, you know, one to 10 milliseconds with normal Profinet. That's using conventional ethernet. However, if we want it faster for the moment for motion control, we've got to use isochronous real time, which means switches and everything else have got to be dedicated with the isochronous real time chipset. And that's where TSN in the future will change things because we use standard chipsets. And again, the limitation for bandwidth on here is 100 meg, where we can go to a gig and above with the TSN environment and still use the native Profinet. Profiles mentioned earlier on, this is where Profibus, Profinet has done well. So we've got the safety side, we've got motor starters. So there's um, the Profi Energy, because again, that's something that's not new. You know, we're talking about conveyors and brakes running, why they're running. So with Profi Energy, and it was the automotive industry, if there's a planned brake on, that will slow down or stop. So we've got control over that. And again, this is all published, and it means as well that if somebody's doing one of these profiles, everything conforms. That was the problem with Modbus in the early days where physically different people did different things. Probably 50% was the same, but the other 50%, they did their own thing. Therefore, you couldn't actually integrate other product. So that's the beauty of um, Profibus and Profinet having profiles. So you, I'll not do too much, because this is the proxies. It's gonna be catered by um, Peter later on. So all this is is a way of going from whether it's going to be Profibus PA, um, IO Link, or even other protocols into Profinet. It's a way of physically getting our information from legacy systems into the Ethernet environment. Plausible deniability is not a security strategy. Right, so 
lots of people target just for the fun of it. It could be political, you know, we've got Koreans, Chinese who are trying to do nasties and the Russians as well on there. Um, you know, we, we've stuck necks and things, you know, there's been viruses that's done on there. So that was the other thing, isn't it? With COVID is a nasty virus. That doesn't affect robots. However, viruses can affect robots, but you know, not the virus with the flu or things like that. So people are at edge on vulnerability. <clears throat> so firewalls, VPNs, so demilitarized zones on there, but system hardening, you know, basic um, passwords. Vargo as standard has a user as admin and the password's Vargo. Probably 80% of our users don't change it. So system hardening. If you go into the new protocols now with the cockpit, it's a bit of a nuisance when you're showing people, but it'll warn you every time you do something to save, it'll warn you that you haven't changed your password. And that's there for a reason, you know, just for security. It is important. So when people have been asked about Industry 4.0 and the concerns, the um, main thing that comes up is standardization. They just want a standard where you've got interoperability on there. So trends, IOTs, uh, the intersection of IT, Industry 4.0. So to say, the, it is the industrial internet of things where we are interested in on there. And data has been moved into the cloud by OPC UA. That isn't unique to say MQTT is used by many, and you can use both on the same devices. It's not an issue. So networks are most useful. Item support, IIoT, because it's Ethernet. Uh, companies are budgeting to implement IOT. I think, again, more so now because there's a major lack of labor. I've heard some horror stories where people have automated lines um, and they've ended up where they've not had the expertise when the faults occurred and they've actually gone back to using manual labor. It defeats the point, but I think companies now are being forced because labor is a major issue, which means automation is going to be more important and needs to be pushed through. So Profinet of Things supports IoT, so data access of time open standards. So uh, return on investment. So that's the situation. Data in the shop floor going through up into the cloud, being utilized to come back. That's just shown the timeline with uh, 1989 for Profibus. And we're looking at about uh, just over 2,000 for Profinet and then the IO link around about um, 2012 when that came out. So there's been a, a steady progression that's on there. So some of the buzzwords used, TSN, data somatic, security, gigabit strategy, easy network st setup. Plug and play is always a nice one, isn't it? But um, that's not always the case. But certainly OPC UA and TSN are two of the major ones for the, f for the future. So TSN, time sensitive network, what it'll be is any new switches, physically will have the capability where we can um, use that. It's, it really, it's like isochronous real time. It's given prioritization. It was done for the video company. So now with that being standard in the chipset, it means you could go to one gig on there. And certainly when you're looking at OPC UA with TSN, it opens up a lot of things and cross platforms on there. So with that, Continuity in the user's view, same services, same engineering, proven ecosystem, and the standard Ethernet technology, wide range in chip supply. Bear in mind with TSN, existing plant kit won't work. It's got to be the new chipset. So switches now, that chipset's available, so new switches, primarily that's being designed now, will be using the TSN approved chipsets on there. And the limitations, just said on there earlier, gigabit. So Profinet at the moment kind of go over 100 meg. It will be able to go gigabit and above by using that technology, as long as the I.O. has been designed by the manufacturers to do that. And it is very rugged and reliable. What will happen, though, of course, is anything that doesn't have the high priority will be pushed low and will have a, a time span. So TSN, it's only at the physical layer that we're looking at with that at the bottom. Whoops. Go on. So the whole idea with Profinet 
is going to go from the top down. So we've got the capability of going into the cloud with Profinet, and then with the um, proxies, we've got all the existing kit that we've got there going on. And this is the bit which was mentioned earlier on. So what we have is Profinet now, which is going to be Profinet DP, which was the standard APL, the advanced physical layer. So coming on to that, process industries are not so bothered about speed. It would be nice to have speed on there, but you don't get speed and you don't get distance. If you do, it's going to be with fiber optics, which means you can't have power. So at 31.25 kilobits, you've got physically a very slow bus normally with Profibus PA, so it's restricted. Um, and again, with intrinsic safety, we've got limited power requirements on there. And with Ethernet, we couldn't do that. And with Ethernet as well, power over Ethernet, things are starting to change, but they need two wires. So this is the major advancement where we've got the capability where we've gone from, it's four wires, so you've got two pairs of your 100 meg, and you'd have four twisted pairs, eight wires, if it's going to be um, above for, for a gig. So typically, industrial Ethernet is only using four conductors, a, a twisted pair. This is physically taking those standards onto a single twisted pair, but also delivering power. Phil will go into that in more detail later on. But the important part then is we've got a hazardous area environment. We can go um, with distance and also with speed on there with the Ethernet environment. So process automation solution, yes. Yeah. So what we have on there is uh, PI is already components ready for the process automation. And we've already heard the products certainly will be available for next year. Phil, I'm sure, has got more information on that. <coughs> OPC UA has been used by, well, OPC for a long time with uh, people for transferring information with HMIs and things like that. But the UA aspect has brought things uh, more controlled. And we've got the situation now where OPC UA is the means of going into the cloud. But it's also with TSN, it's a way of actually going between different protocols as well. So in the future, we'll be looking at Profinet. We'll be able to talk to Ethernet IP and other protocols by using OPC UA as well as the TSN adaption of that. Safety is important. Um, figures are on there where ProfiSafe is the concept that's used with ProfiNet and ProfiBus. And there's options as well with that, where with OPC, UA, and uh, TSN, it's a black channel. It doesn't matter. You'll be able to take ProfiSafe onto other protocols and other equipment. So you're going to get the flexibility on that. So the, the cloud, so we've got Industry 4, leads to increased TCP IP communications. So from the device to the cloud, we've got also the normal environment. We're not just sending things into the cloud. We've also got the normal SCADA and the MES uh, requirements as well. So there will be more network activity on there. One area is um, being looked at as well is for languages. So you know, if we said Jaguar, some people are going to think it's a cat. Others are going to think it's a car, although others are saying it is a cat with respect to the Jaguar car. So there's a, an area come out now which is called E-classes. And again, this is going with the OPC UA as well, is to try and get conformance to ensure that you know, the, the, the terminology is the same no matter which company or which country it has been used in. So that will sort things out on there. So. That's the end of my presentation, guys. So thank you for listening. And Mr. Ver <laughs> Andy's turned up. Thank you. Anybody got any questions? Yeah, we've just got a few more minutes yet f uh, for break. But uh, in terms of what Derek's been saying and the way that the industry's going, uh, just really wanted to say a few words of uh, the problems I see from a support point of view. Uh, clearly, we're here to talk about the technology of ProfiNet nowadays, an industrial Ethernet-based uh, network. And if I had to kind of summarize the faults that I get called out on on a ProfiNet network, I would kind of categorize them as being either a lack of design in the first place or an uncontrolled change to the design of the network. And one of the things with ProfiNet is it's a time-critical 
uh, industrial network protocol. What that means in the real world is that each device on your network is given a particular polling rate. You, that's very different from Profibus, where you just had the board rate, the bit rate for the entire network. Now the designer has got the option of setting the time on a device by device basis. In my experience, most people leave it to the PLC to sort this out. And also in my experience, it tends to mean it's virtually flat out across the board. So very often when I, when I get a call, I'm always getting issues about outages. And the first thing I say to people is, does this really need to run at two milliseconds? And basically, there's a bit of a work there for designers to look at in terms of the polling rate on a device by device basis. Now that's just Profinet. So let's give you an example where one of those devices, you decided it was two millisecond polling rate because it was particularly important. Well, in the Profinet world, after two milliseconds, the watchdog comes into play. So basically, it's typically three times the polling rate. So we're now talking for a two millisecond polling rate, six milliseconds. If that guy doesn't get a valid message within six milliseconds, he's gone. And that potentially could be your plant has gone. Now, if you now start to add all of this data as well, which is typically TCP, very loading on the network, if we don't design it, we're going to have a problem. And I would say generally that the problems are associated with a kind of uncontrolled mix of Profinet real-time communication and this relatively slow network as well, uh, protocols as well. It's designed to do it for sure, but there's the word design. There is an aspect of you can't just keep adding on. Eventually, it'll come back to bite you. Now, I'm go this is not the Peter and Derek show, by the way. Uh, there are other people talking here. Uh, but um, at the, after the break, uh, I'm going to bring to show you literally how we would connect all of these things. What is around available that if you, for example, wanted to stick with Profibus, but you fancied having a go with Profinet and using some of your Profibus equipment. What happens if you were using Canbus or uh, RZ and things like that? So I'll be showing you that and literally how it's done in a PLC environment. And although it will be Siemens, if you're not a Siemens user, it's fundamentally a button pressing exercise. So whatever PLC you use, it would be valid. So the only thing now is that um, later on we've got some uh, a question and answer session here. Um, we've put together presentations here that we think will be of interest to, to guys like you. Is there anything that you particular would like to ask? Not necessarily now, so that we can at least get prepared for it later on. So take the opportunity now if there's something that you fundamentally don't understand or you thought you understand and now you, you don't. Is there anything in particular that you'd like us to make a note of that we could address later on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so Ian comes from a pharmaceutical background, a heavily regulated background, the the industry that loves paper and evidence, basically. And most, although I've got a lot of experience of working in the pharmaceutical industry, most of the industries I work in do not like paper and they don't want any evidence as well. And that is probably the biggest issue with the networks: a complete lack of qualification at the installation phase and at the operational phase. So what I mean by the installation phase, well, it would be a pretty good idea to ask the installers to test the cable before they handed it over. That invariably doesn't get done. They will assume that if they install the network, well, let's leave it to the PLC guy. He'll tell us if we're communicating. And the PLC guy says, yes, we're communicating. Bad idea. Because yes, the PLC guy hasn't lied, he is communicating, but you've got no idea as to the physical uh, aspect of the network. We could have shorts to shield, it would still work. You can have all sorts of problems that you just don't know. So somebody needs to look into this. So basically the idea of the qualification is some kind of formal document that basically describes a limited number of tests. I have tested this cable and just put your signature next to it. It's not that difficult. That's basically it as far as the installation. 
The operational is a bit different because most people in reality are interested in the application specific testing, checking various, various sequences, various PID loops and things like that. And they work on the basis that if they've got through that commissioning without any alarms and everything's fine, happy days, invoice paid. What we don't really know is whether the PLC is struggling to communicate with these devices. And generally, and the Siemens guys, I, I apologize to you, but basically, as far as I'm concerned, PLCs will tell you the blatant obvious. They've lost communications to a given device. They cannot tell you why they have lost communication. They weren't designed for that. So you need extra monitoring equipment that will also audit your network to prove the absence of various things like telegram gaps in Profinet and re retries in Profibus, etc. And if you don't do that, well, it'll come back to bite you. And if not immediately, in months or years to come. And that's what keeps me busy for 50% of my time. So, yep, OK. Anything else? Any, if, yeah? Well, OK. I, it, it, it depends on which, which hat I'm putting on. From a, from a PI point of view, just the fact that you're using a diagnostic tool is good in the first place. What you need to be aware of is really what is the quality criteria for that network. So if we were talking of Profibus, you'd be talking of an absence of retries, uh, an absence of uh, corrupted telegrams, an absence of diagnostics and things like that. You just put it on the network and let it monitor. Grab yourself a coffee while it's monitoring it and come back and print a report. If it says zeros, well, great, that's it. In the Profinet world, very different technology, but it's things like um, jitter is a bit of an issue. It's a timing-related problem. Um, telegram gaps. In the Profinet world, every telegram has got a counter, a number that increments. And these analyzers can detect a break in the sequence. So it's a bit of a warning of something coming your way before the PLC says, I've lost communication. So there's a, a lots of different things. But yet yeah, fundamentally, though, there is a significant difference between Profibus and Profinet at that level. Yeah, you go. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, one of, the big, one of the things that I'm seeing, I don't know whether you guys are seeing this as well, is that initially, if anybody goes over to Profinet, they know it is Ethernet based, and so they assume that their IT department will help them out. And that probably is how it starts until they start to see PLCs and timing and things like that. And suddenly, this becomes the control department's Ethernet network and not the IT department. So what that really means is the people, the control guys, who might know about pinging need to know a lot more about it, first of all. And there's terminology like port mirroring and uh, taps and routers and all this kind of thing that people need to know about. So it's, uh, yeah, we could talk about Profinet in particular, but that's basically an issue. From, a, from an industrial Ethernet point of view, there's a little bit of learning because these guys don't know it. They're not expected to know it. So, base, sorry. So, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. That's for the monitoring concept. So, in future, we see like switches will give the monitoring concept more in the future. So, what is the take on that? Uh, uh, the only thing I disagree with that is the future. Uh, basically, the worst thing that you can do on a Profinet network is to install an unmanaged switch. Absolutely the worst thing. Uh, if you've spent a lot of money on these nice shiny boxes of uh, analyzers, you have severely limited the capability of those devices. Basically, one of the ways that Profinet uh, analyzers work is they send out uh, diagnostic requests, something called SNMP requests. The only devices, the only switches that will respond are typically managed switches. In the PI world, something called conformance class B switches. If you've got an unmanaged switch, it will work perfectly fine from a real-time point of view, but it will not answer the questions. So it becomes very, very difficult if the PLC is saying he's losing communications to a particular device 
X meters down the other end of the factory and you've got six or seven switches in line, you don't know which of them may be dropping those telegrams. So you will regret using unmanaged switches on a Profinet network without a doubt. And that's all now, not the future, basically. Yeah, you, you certainly wouldn't normally go down that route. No, well, well, yeah, it depends, who's paying, it depends who's paying for the project. Uh, if, you, if you're paying for the project, you're probably going down the cheapest route. But, and that is the reality. And the, it really is a problem. So the companies like Presenta, like Indosol and so on, that have got uh, these tools, they are severely uh, hampered by unmanaged switches and it's very difficult to uh, overcome that. You don't have a port maroon problem with unmanaged switches, you see everything. No, sorry? So you don't have a port maroon problem with unmanaged well, switches, yeah, you see everything. True. Yeah, that's true. So yeah, any, any other questions, anything in particular? I mean, clearly now, how many here just out of interest are in the world that Profibus is state of the art? It's their thing at the moment. Is there any, anybody here that is now a regular user of Profibus. What about Profinet then, in terms of uh, uh, using Profinet? Don't be shy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so in terms of, uh, are, we, uh, are people here now generally to learn about the technologies rather than being experienced with them? That's the idea, yeah, okay. So what are you using at the moment as far as the, the technologies? Yeah. Uh, well, all, all the of the yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. The the main issue with all of these, Profibus included, is that they were designed primarily to carry the cyclic data between a PLC and that device. We're now talking that industry in general is looking beyond that. It's basically wanting data for other purposes to give them a better knowledge of their process. And you're not going to get that over that infrastructure. And that's what Profinet is all about. It can carry the cyclic data. And if the network is designed well, it will also carry this, what we call non-real-time data as well. It's designed for doing that. 